when we pointed that out and had quite a useful discussion, they actually um, offered to, well, actually, Mummy said to them, well, you'll just have to take it off then, won't you? And given their due, they did. And um, they bent the line to the north and carried on and left our land in peace, which is what we'd asked to happen. But that's just the seismic survey. The seismic survey gives them data to back up earlier information to say um, where the prospect is where it would make sense to drill test wells. And TAG and Apache wish to drill four test wells on the east coast, two in the Gisborne region, one close to Porangahau at what they call Boar Hill at Sarah Shoulders, and one in the Dannyburg region. And there are two test wells that have been chosen so far. One is the Boar, the Boar Hill site and one in the Gisborne region. Boar Hill was chosen because, as Sarah pointed out, in 2009, a subsidiary of TAG Oil drilled a stratigraphic well where they take a core sample. So they don't test the oil flow, but they test the, um, the rock formations, which give an indication of whether it's likely to um, be oil rich or not. Because that well pad was already there, they decided it would make sense to drill the first test well on that site. We we're up to at the moment is that the companies haven't yet filed their resource consent application with the Hawke's Bay Regional Council for the test well. And as far as I'm aware, they don't yet have an access agreement with the landowner. There's been quite a lot of debate in the Hawke's Bay media about the Hawke's Bay Regional Council's role in um, publicly notifying that resource consent application when it's filed or not. I wrote to Apache, which appears to be the senior partner in this partnership, asking that as the applicant, whether TAG and Apache would uh, request full public notification of the resource consent application, which would allow the Hawke's Bay public and our communities the opportunity to present our views and for there to be some kind of public debate in a rational way because I don't actually believe that the media is the right vehicle for that. Where is it that the Hawke's Bay community was given the opportunity to say what it thought about oil exploration and the development of our communities? Where was it that the Port Ho community got to engage with the government about what we saw as appropriate use of our land in our community. And as I've watched Tag and Apache do, I have to say, a reasonable job of engaging with various groups in our community. The absence of any politician has screamed at me. Where are the politicians who were elected to be our representatives to Parliament? Or are they their party's representatives to us? Where are the politicians discussing with New Zealanders what we want our energy strategy to be? Because the government created an energy strategy last year for the next 10 years, from 2011 to 2021. That energy strategy very clearly says that the government will pursue aggressively the opening of New Zealand up to oil and gas exploration. Where was it that they discussed that with us? Where was it that they discussed bringing in overseas investment to drill, well I'll get to this bit and I'll show you our painting, <laughs> to drill into the puku of Papatuanuku to extract out this oil so that it can then be exported. We're not even going to use it here. And so, unpopular though this opinion may be, I think it's been easy to, um, and certainly actually Taranaki has got very good reason for it, but my beef is actually with the government. My beef is with the government around its arrogant decisions on our behalf without any consultation 
or was the consultation last year when we ticked two boxes? And if that's the case, then Tag and Apache's consultation has been a heck of a lot better than the government's, which is a serious, serious worry. Anyway, I just want to keep in my pack. There are posters, oops, of this painting um, that say Kaitiaki o Papituanku Maranga Mai. And I guess this is um, one of my messages for us. The reason that our family has a serious issue with oil exploration per se, and yes, we share your concerns about hydraulic fracturing, but to us, the issue is not necessarily, it was not actually how we violate Papatuanaku. Our issue is whether or not Papatuanaku should be violated at all. And I agree with Sarah that when you think about current land use, um, we're a, a sheep and beef farming area. We have the longest place name in the world, just down the road, Tito Matafakatangi Hanga Koa Rauru Tamate Aturi Pukaka Piki Mama Wila Niku Puka Fina Ki Tangatanga. And we have a Māori community that still lives close to our land. This is what is being proposed for our area. This painting, by the way, is painted by one of our Pākehā Koroa, um, who's currently in hospital having a hip replacement. And he's given this to um, this movement in order that can be used to raise money for legal support if anybody needs it. And if you look carefully, you'll see the red line, which is what I call the catheter. The catheter that oil companies insert into Papatuanaku's body in order, in order to be able to extract her blood. The trouble though, and shown by this painting, is that her blood, well, they don't actually have permits that sit over arteries and veins. So in order to be able to get the blood out, they have to pump fluids and chemicals and sand into her organs to split them apart in order to be able to suck the blood out. And if you have a look here, you will see the oil derricks in the 80s. And if you look carefully, you'll see a number of words that fill the page. And the top one is frack, then crack, then crash, then trash. And that's Don's interpretation of what he sees our community being faced with. The scariest thing is that TAG and Apache aren't the only companies, as Sarah said. I'm aware of 23 oil companies operating in the Taranaki region, and I'm aware that there are at least two operating there who are on their way over here. TAG and Apache, like Sarah said, are the beginning. And although the resource consent application, which is due to be filed fairly soon, will be simply for a test well, which has a life of three weeks. So they come in with more trucks than you can imagine. They put up, they build the test well pad, they bring the drill rig in, they drill a hole, they then fract hydraulically fracture, or are most likely to hydraulically fracture at two different depths to assess whether or not the oil will flow in sensible quantities. And then they cap it and they go it away. And people at home have said, well, that's okay. It's only three weeks. They'll be gone. But the trouble is that if they find what they want to find, they won't be gone. And if we don't stop this now, we won't actually stop it at all. And so again at home, there are lots of people, and I, I didn't say this at the beginning, I need to be really clear, that today I'm here representing my auntie, my mother, my daughter and her descendants, and my sister and her children are also here. I'm not here representing Ngāti Manuhiri or Ngāti Kere, because
because sadly, as hapu, we're still coming to grips with the situation and haven't yet reached a position. We're here talking about this because our land is very close to this test well site. And although we may not own that land, Ngāti Manuhiri, whom we affiliate to, has mana whenua for that whole Mangorapi area. And although that land isn't in our ownership anymore, we still feel a, responsible to, a responsibility towards that land and the waterways. And as I explained before, the flow from those waterways covers the whole Pūrangaho and goes out to the sea. So now I've completely lost where I was at. Um, <laughs> So the kind of defeatism, I suppose, that many people in Porangaho are feeling is that this is too big. We can't stop this. And the kōrero I've said to them is that women didn't use to vote in this country because it was against the law. And the United States wanted to bring nuclear weapons into this country, but we stood up and said no, and who are we? Some little dot at the bottom of the ocean. And that my uncle the other day at the Tangi, who was in the Navy, said that if people hadn't thought they could defeat Hitler, what would the world be like now? And for those from Taranaki, Te Whiti o Rungumai and Tohu Kākahi at Parihaka did not say, oh, it's too hard, it's no point in trying. They stood there with their old people and their children and they resisted. And we can do exactly the same. But what we need to do that is we need to talk to each other, we need to be informed, and we need to have the courage to stand up for what we believe in in the face of arguments that sound plausible. Because the economic argument I could make sound plausible, but I don't believe it. Because I actually think that this, um, apart from the, the fact of ignoring the very central role that Western culture gives to money, and I don't believe it deserves that central role. But ignoring that for a minute, there are some things that we can do right now as individuals to change that situation. So I am beating myself up because I did this year buy two pairs of gumboots from the warehouse for the price of one, and I did that because last year the gumboots I bought from the warehouse actually crapped out on me. And then I went and I bought two more pairs. But if I'd actually gone and bought a decent pair of gumboots that would last me nine or ten years, A, I wouldn't be using so many petroleum products because the richer things are made of plastic. And B, I wouldn't be filling up our landfills or Papatu Anaku's puku with that rubbish. And C, I wouldn't be sending a whole lot of money overseas with imports. People often think that we need big solutions to things, and I don't agree with that. My sister's telling me it's time I've got to show um, I think, really believe that it's small actions that make the difference. The little things that we do really make a difference. And so probably last year, my mother and I would have bought separate cars because that would have been more flexible in case we wanted to do anything. But actually, we came in one car today. And um, when you start to seriously think about petroleum and the role that it plays in our lives, we can reduce our reliance on it. Other things like small things, growing our own food, swapping with neighbours, the kinds of things that I guess that you people already do. Speaking to other people about those things. Spreading that kind of courage to stand up for what you believe in is how we can actually make a difference. And I believe that we can actually stop this happening here. And to finish up, one of my cousins said, look, we want to stop it, but we're not going to stop it, so we should plan for what happens when we don't. I said, well, if you believe you won't, you won't. So plan A is, everything you can think of is stop it. Plan B is everything else you've got the first time. And plan C is let's go back and try those things again. There is strength in all of us working together. As happened in South Africa, when 
the apartheid laws were dismantled as well. We can do that, and we will. And then we'll go over to Taranaki and Wanaha to Sarah. Mm -hmm. Thank mm -hmm. you. 